All right, good evening. Welcome everyone to another edition of the I Am Able Foundation's Medicine Makers, where if your destination is a career in medicine, we're going to show you how to get there. I hope everyone is doing well this evening. I am your host, Dr. Renee Roberts, board certified family medicine physician, and I am super excited today uh, to welcome our guest this evening. This is the lovely Dr. Erica Taylor. She is a board certified obstetrician, uh, gynecologist, and women's health expert. Uh, for those of you that do not know, January is actually National Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, and Dr. Taylor is with us uh, today to speak about uh, all things cervical cancer uh, and the Well Women exam. So thank you, Dr. Taylor, for joining us tonight on Medicine Makers. Thank you, Dr. Renee. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. You are very welcome. So before we segue into tonight's discussion with Dr. Taylor, I'd just like to give uh, a few announcements. You are watching Medicine Makers uh, on CAM TV. We air on cable channel 21 and uh, AT&T channel 99. For those of you that want to check us out online on the web, you can go to www.camtv.org forward slash hotline. And uh, as well, I'd like to let all of you know that this is a live call-in show. That's right. So get your phones out if you have questions uh, for Dr. Taylor this evening about cervical cancer or the Well Woman exam. Uh, please feel free to give us a call at area code 312-738-1060. Uh, as well, for those of you that do not know um, about the I Am Able Foundation, we are a nonprofit organization based here in Chicago, and we are helping to raise the next generation of healthcare healthcare heroes. Excuse me. Um, and so, what that means, if you are a high school student, college student, or post baccalaureate student who aspires to be a doctor, um, we are the program for you. We provide you with a physician mentor. Um, one great announcement for those of you that are interested in joining the program, uh, we are actually in the middle of our application cycle. Um, so if you are in high school, college, or post back student, or if you are an adult out there that knows someone uh, that falls into that category that is interested in becoming a physician, um, please go to the I Am Able Foundation website, uh, www.iamable.org, and able is spelled A-B-E-L. Uh, we are accepting applications through March 1st. Okay. All right. Well, we are going to go ahead and get started today. Again, this is Dr. Erica Taylor, uh, board certified obstetrician gynecologist. It's Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started today. I think it would be good uh, to uh, talk with our audience and tell us a little bit about how you became an obstetrician. Absolutely. So i um, my initial journey to OBGYN was quite circuitous. I remember reading an article in undergrad which basically talked about the disparities that exist between black women and white women in regards to cancers such as breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And I was very disheartened at that time to see that more white women were actually being diagnosed with breast cancer, but more black women were dying. Mm -hmm. And that really compelled me to um, seek out a career in women's health. So after um, undergrad, I actually completed a master's in public health at uh, the University of Iowa um, with an emphasis in epidemiology. And I just really felt like that background, along with my undergrad degree, would definitely prepare me um, for the field of women's health. And so fast forward, I was a <laughs> non-traditional student, so I ended up um, going to medical school at IU. And I'm currently working here in the Chicago area, but my focus is working with underserved women because I feel like this is the area where the health care disparities affect this population most, and I feel like this is where I'm most needed. Okay, well, thank you so much. And for those of you that don't know, Dr. Taylor is actually one of our physician mentors as well um, with the I Am Able Foundation. Would you like to comment just a little bit on what you enjoy about being a physician mentor? Sure, absolutely. I just feel like being a physician mentor, I just think back to the number of the numerous mentors that poured into me mm. as I was coming through my path. My path was, again, I say was not a straight line, but circuitous. And I feel I've basically practiced the adage to whom much is given, much is expected. So I'm actually working with a young lady who she's not quite sure, you know, if she wants to do medicine, but I, I still meet with her and we discuss various topics just in regards to um, 
career her career path and so she's she's torn at this point but I think that it's very important that she has a sounding board to kind of discuss you know the different roles within the medical field and so hopefully I'll get her out to shadow me soon okay excellent all right thank you so much well again um, you are watching medicine makers January is national cervical cancer awareness month so that is where we are going to start oh, in with right. today um, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, dr. Taylor about what is cervical cancer so cervical cancer is basically a mutation or a change that can occur in the cervix so in regards to a little anatomy exam yes. a little anatomy <laughs> review I wish I had brought some pictures to actually draw out but the uterus connects the cervix connects the uterus to the vagina and typically in regards to cervical cancer that's diagnosed on a pap smear and the cells will usually mutate and so that's sent off to the lab and they can tell us if there's abnormalities so typically before the abnormalities develop um, you can see these changes called dysplasia or precancerous cells and um, also in regards to cervical cancer more than 99% of patients will have HPV, which is the human papillomavirus. Okay. There are currently more than 100 different subtypes. Oh. Out of that 100 subtypes, 14 are cancer-causing. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are responsible for the most of the cancer will be types 16 and 18. So they will be responsible for causing more than 70% of cervical cancers. So one of the things that we are now doing in women who are 30 and up is also adding on something called co-testing, where you would check for the human papillomavirus as well at the time of the pap smear. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. So we'd also like to know, since it's January and it's National Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, why is that important? Well, I think it's very important. First of all, cervical cancer is one of the cancers that's 100% preventable. Mm -hmm. The way to prevent it, first of all, we have to educate and make sure that the public is aware. And prevention would include routine pap smears, and we'll go more into pap smear guidelines a little bit later, as well as the HPV vaccination. Other ways to prevent um, transmission of the HPV vaccine would be avoidance of intercourse or using condoms, um, decreasing or cessation of tobacco use, and then also just making sure that you follow up. Um, like if you have an abnormal pap smear, it's really important that you follow that up. I think sometimes we have patients that come in and we have an abnormal exam and for whatever reason it could be a loss of insurance or their fear of knowing the results, sometimes they're lost. And I just okay. think it's really important that we educate the public in regards to ways that we can prevent this condition. Okay, very good. Um, so if I am curious to know what are some of the symptoms of cervical cancer, how do I know if I have cervical cancer? Okay, so some of the common symptoms would be bleeding. So bleeding either after intercourse, bleeding in between your periods. Mm -hmm. If you're menopausal, if you have any bleeding after you've had um, your menses has stopped, it's important to get that followed up. So we call it postmenopausal bleeding. So the average age of menopause is about 51. So if you go one full year without a period, mm -hmm. we usually will call that menopause. Okay. And so someone who starts to bleed subsequently to that, we would recommend that you get follow up for that. Okay. Other issues would be frequent urination, pelvic pain, and things of that nature. So it's important that if you have any of these symptoms, that you should follow up with your OBGYN or your primary care provider. Okay, so um, how do I know if I personally um, am, at, am at risk for developing cervical cancer? So one of the most important things would be to have routine pap smears. Okay. And so the pap smear, we utilize a device called a speculum. Um, it looks like a duck bill. <laughs> and so typically we start doing cervical cancer screening slash pap smears at age 21. And we would do them every three years. Once women reach the age of 30, we add on co-testing. So if you're having a pap every three years, it will be every three years with a pap alone. If you add on HPV testing, it's every five years if both are negative. In patients that are um, have HIV or immunocompromised, and it's important that they get followed more frequently. Okay, so um, I know you mentioned starting at age 21. Or is that actually like the uh, current practice guidelines? That is the current practice guideline. However, the difference would be if a patient does have an immunocompromised system, mm -hmm. then you would start earlier. And what do you mean by immunocompromised So system? a patient that has HIV 
or has had an organ transplant or is on chronic steroids, those patients will have a lower immune system. And so it's important that they start their pap smear. Sometimes they may start before the age of 21. So let's say someone is diagnosed with HIV, let's say at 16, you actually want to initiate that first pap smear within the first year of their diagnosis and then follow them up with pap smears yearly for three years. Once they've had three negative pap smears in a row, then you can space the pap smears out to every three years. Okay, well I know um, both of us obviously are practicing physicians. Um, we have had many patients are, have come in and asked about the HPV vaccination. And I was uh, wondering if you could just share with our audience a little bit more about the HPV vaccine. Absolutely. So the HPV vaccine, or you may see some of the commercials out here, which they call it Gardasil is the brand name. And currently, our current vaccine actually covers against nine different types of HPV. So in regards to that, there are two that lead to uh, genital warts. So those are the benign types, type 6 and 11. And then the other seven are focused on more cancer-causing agents. And so the recommendation currently is to start to vaccinate children, male or female, at the age of 11 to 12. However, you can start as early as nine, and recent guidelines came out this past fall stating that you can continue it up to 45. Prior to that, it had been age 26. So one of the thoughts is that if the patient is immunized pre at a preteen age, that their immune response is actually heightened. So it's better if they get it at an earlier age than waiting to like 16 or 18. But I think it's important just to do it, but definitely if you're doing it at that 11 to 12 year age, it's, it's better. Okay, so I actually have a personal question for you because I've run into this um, a lot sometimes with my patients uh, in the clinic, um, particularly when I am seeing um, teenagers 12, 13 and up. Um, I have parents that are hesitant uh, to get their child vaccinated against HPV. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a stigma um, attached with HPV because it is sexually transmitted. Um, and a lot of parents fear that if I give my child this vaccination, that is going to give them the green light to engage in premature um, sexual activity. So how would you address that issue? So I would utilize this as a time for education of both the child and the parent. And I would talk about HPV and how it's transmitted. And then also reassuring the parent that this is not a green light to say that the child can run off and have intercourse. Um, I would really focus more on the immune response because the earlier that they receive it, then their immune response is greater. Also, there's currently two different dosing uh, regimens. So there's a two dose, you can receive two doses if you receive it as a preteen, mm -hmm. versus like if you receive it later, then it's three doses. And that's another way that I would talk to parents, like, you know, three, three shots versus two. That's a big deal. And that's, I think, you know, mm -hmm. if I was a kid, I'd say I'd take two. Okay. Could you touch a little bit upon about that term that you used, immune response? What exactly does that mean for those of us that are watching that may not obviously uh, have a great medical background? What, does, right. what do you mean by immune right. response? So one of the issues, so with the virus, so the virus will um, basically attack, can attack the body. So your body will actually produce a product that can help fight off the vaccination. Okay. And so the vaccine is actually producing those quote unquote antibodies or those fighters that help to fight the virus off. Mm -hmm. And so their response is much stronger if you receive it as a preteen compared to later. Okay, so if we got vaccinated early on, we would be down to two vaccinations as opposed to three. Correct. Okay, excellent. Um, so let's see, how long does it take to develop cervical cancer? On average, in a patient, let's say, who does not have HIV or has no issues with their immune system, it's roughly 15 to 20 years. In a patient that has HIV and who's not being treated for their HIV, which means that they were immunocompromised or their immune system is weakened, then those patients can develop it within 5 to 10 years. Okay. Hence, that's one of the reasons why it's very important that patients that have HIV are screened more frequently than patients who do not. Okay, and how often? Oh, wait a minute, hold on now. Caller. Looks like we have a caller. All right, let's see. Go ahead, caller. Hi, ma'am. If I was a parent today, I would have a problem trying to navigate through all this stuff. There's people that would tell other people to put, especially a girl, 12-year-old, put them on birth control pills. 
as we well know, birth control pills and other types of methods do not protect them from other sex uh diseases as well. And I have a problem with some people trying to pressure people in terms of doing things and whatever happened to do what's in the best interest of your own child. Okay, thank you, caller. How would you like to address that? Absolutely. So at first and uh, foremost, I think that it's a time to come in and to educate both the parent and the child. And I think that ultimately at the end of the day, I give you the information and then it's up to you to decide what's best for you and your child. So I don't think you should feel pressured by a physician. One of the things that as physicians, one of the things that we learn in med school is something called a condition called autonomy, a term called autonomy, and it's basically self-rule. And so we will basically present the information to the patient. However, it's up to you to decide if that's best for you and your child. Okay, and I think, uh, you know, the caller did make a good point, too, um, is that education is important, having the conversation is important. Um, again, uh, like she'd mentioned, birth control actually does not protect against Correct. sexually transmitted infections. So a lot of this, I know Dr. Taylor does this, and I know I do this as well um, in the office with my patients, um, particularly the parents of the uh, young teenagers, is that you really need to facilitate open uh, communication uh, and do that often. Okay. All right. Uh, let's move on here. So I am curious, you know, you mentioned earlier about, um, you noticed about the discrepancies um, between um, uh, Caucasian women or uh, brown uh, and black women in terms of their um, outcomes with things like cervical cancer. Are there any type of programs in place um, to help improve those numbers or to improve testing? Yes, well currently there are two programs here in the Chicago area. There is the Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Prevention Program, IBCCP, and they offer free and or low-cost mammograms and pap smears to patients who meet certain income guidelines. And their number is 888-522-1282, and you can contact them to see if you qualify for their services. The other organization that also offers the same services would be the Equal Hope organization. They're formerly the Chicago Metropolitan Breast Task Force organization and their number is 312-942-3368. So in regards to Equal Hope, they actually put out an article um, this past week where their goal is 100% eradication, so basically getting rid of cervical cancer in the city of Chicago. So that's huge. That is fantastic. Well, that is great information, Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much um, for sharing that with us. And it looks like you are a popular lady tonight. We actually have another caller. Um, welcome to Medicine Makers. I'm your host, Dr. Roberts, and you are speaking with the lovely Dr. Erica Taylor this evening. Go ahead, caller, with your question. Hi, thank you for allowing me to ask a question. I've been told by some people that, you know, once you have a hysterectomy, you don't have to worry about, you know, getting pap smears or cervical cancer, you know, if you had it out for fibroids or whatever. But some of my friends actually say that they do get regular pap smears, and some of them said they actually been told by their doctors that they have to. So I was wondering if you can just comment and help us know, for us ladies who may have had a hysterectomy, you know, what is our, you know, what should we concern ourselves with as it relates to cervical cancer? Absolutely. Great question. Thank you for calling. So in regards to cervical cancer, so first of all, it depends on what type of hysterectomy you had. So if you had a total hysterectomy, that means that your uterus and your cervix were both removed. In that event, you would not need pap smears because the pap smear will actually screen the cervix. So in a patient that doesn't have a cervix, you wouldn't need to do a pap smear unless, there's one caveat, unless you have a history of abnormal pap smears. So in regards to abnormal pap smear history, if you've had something called dysplasia, which is basically like a precancerous cell, then you would continue to have pap smears for at least 20 years after um, your hysterectomy has been done. And so that's important just to know. I think sometimes we talk to our friends and they may not always give you the complete story. So finding out if they had their cervix removed or not, and then if, if they're willing to share with you, they may not, if they've had a history of abnormal pap smears. 
So the other type of pap smear is called a super cervical. So that means that the cervix is left in place. And those women would continue to have routine pap smears after um, the hysterectomy. Okay, that's a very good question because I know I get asked that question um, a lot as well. What to do when you've had that hysterectomy, whether or not you still need to get uh, your pap smear. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and continue on with our discussion. If you are just now tuning in, um, this is Medicine Makers. We have Dr. Uh, Taylor with us this evening, obstetrician, gynecologist, and women's health expert. Um, in the last uh, few minutes of the show here, would you have some time to um, talk a little bit about the Well Woman examination and what that entails? Absolutely. So the Well Woman exam is an annual exam that we recommend for women, and it in regards to when it should start, I think that moms can make the decision in regards to when they want to bring their child in for um, the gynecological exam. Typically, we recommend them starting about 12 to 13. And during that time, it's more of like a time for education, mm -hmm. talking about anatomy, um, discussing various issues, um, going to like their educational goals, mm -hmm. discussing issues such as depression, screening them for their, um, like if there's any history of depression or is there violence in the household and things of that nature. And a young girl who's less than 21, there's no need to do a physical exam, mm -hmm. a vaginal exam or a speculum okay. exam on them unless they have some concerns in regards to like uh, vaginitis or some abnormal vaginal discharge and things of that nature. Um, and so the other things that we end up adding on to the women wellness exam, so at 21 that's when we start offering the pap smear. Okay. We do something called a clinical breast exam where um, the breasts are examined for any lumps or abnormalities in skin changes. This is also the time where we teach um, breast self-awareness. And so we've kind of, um, the pendulum is swung from teaching self-breast exams to more of breast awareness. And so it's just mm -hmm. important to know what's normal for you and your breast, like looking at your breasts. I still recommend that patients still touch them because mm -hmm. I think it's important that you do that because a lot of times women, we're the ones that find our lumps or our partners may find our lumps. True. And so I think that you should be very comfortable with touching your breasts and knowing if there are any abnormalities. The other things that would uh, be included in the women wellness exam would be a colonoscopy. And the current recommendation would be to start at age 50. However, in African-American women, you should start getting colon screening at age 45. And that recommendation came out a few years ago. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Do you have um, any final takeaway points, anything that you'd like our audience uh, this evening uh, to walk away with with regards to um, cervical cancer awareness or the Well Women examination? Well, in regards to cervical cancer awareness, I would first say that knowledge is power. Prevention by going out and getting your pap smear. So again, starting at age 21, having that done every three years. I know often some women will come in and say, I'm used to having it done every year, every two years. And if that woman's comfortable having that done, I would still do it more frequently if they request it. Um, current guidelines do state to do it every three. And then adding with HPV at age 30, then you would do it every five years. Um, I think that in regards to... Um, I just wanted to just circle back to equal hope and the healthcare mm -hmm. disparities and how their goal is 100% prevention of cervical cancer in the Chicago area. So right now we have roughly about 13,000 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer every year. 4,000 women die. Oh, wow. And so mm -hmm. that's why it's so important that we go out and get those pap smears done. So call a friend. I mean, set a date. I mean, pick the month. Pick the day of your birthday and say, hey, I'm just going to call my doc and get that pap smear done because it's very important. And then if you have children, you know, consider uh, the vaccine. Definitely there's lots of educational information out there. I usually would like to have patients to read over the information in regards to vaccine before making a choice. Also, I know there's sometimes there's some... Um, negative side effects that people have seen in regards to the vaccinations. And so the most common things would be pain at the site of the vaccination, redness, fever, nausea, and sometimes dizziness. 
Okay. So again, screening, screening, screening. Screening is key. Education is important. All right. Well, looks like our time is coming to a close. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening and watching the I Am Able Foundation's Medicine Makers. I am your host, Dr. Renee Roberts, and our lovely guest this evening was Dr. Erica Taylor, board-certified obstetrician, gynecologist, and women's health expert. You just received a great dose of knowledge about cervical cancer awareness and the Well Woman Exam. Please tune in next week, same time, 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll have another great show for you. Thank you guys very much for tuning in and have a good night. Great. Good night.